lots of um, similarities in your presentations and some nice uh, talking points for us to pick up on. I'll open it up to discussion in a few minutes, but I wanted to just pick up on some of the ideas that have been floated already, starting with David. Uh, uh, you talked about the high value nature of head office jobs. Uh, I'd like you to just talk us through a little bit your notion of a head office and the correlation with high office, high value jobs. Uh, not every high value job is associated with the head office, of mm. course, and not all head office functions uh, are necessarily defined as head offices, if you know what I mean. Uh, just talk us through a little bit the different variations of investment that London is trying to attract that fall into the category of a head office, even if they are not head offices per se. So help us clarify our own thinking around the kinds of uh, investments that we are looking for that have the characteristics of head offices, even if they may not be defined as head offices. Okay. So I think there's, there's three categories that I would... I would go for. So there's a global head office headquarters. If you try and shift a global headquarters, I don't think that's the game we should be in because they tend to be where the company was founded or at least they stay in the country where the company is founded. Shifting a global headquarters is really, really tricky. Second one... HSBC. I'll fight you for it. <laughs> you asked for it. You asked for it. <laughs> we ain't leaving the European Union, people. You heard it here first. Anyway, international headquarters. That is much more interesting because, and we see this a lot with, with West Coast US companies, it may be that the decision makers and the attitudes within the global HQ are not necessarily best suited to running a global business. So they want or see the need for an international headquarters elsewhere. And I suspect the same holds true of companies in Asia because it's very difficult to to run, I think, a global operation with all the variances between the markets if you're in Beijing and Shanghai. So there's an international headquarters. And then there's regional, which for us would be European headquarters, where there is a regional market that has many similarities, which in our case would be the European free trade area, you know, the EU plus Norway and Switzerland, and you need to make strategic decisions. So they're, they're the sort of three categories. And I think... It's when, when you look at the numbers that people like Deloitte and McKinsey use, they use foreign subsidiaries in the same way as we're talking about headquarters and head, uh, head office. So I think, I think the thing that needs to be in it for it really to be a, a headquarter function is strategic decision makers or decision makers with the power to make decisions for that market. And that's when, when we go after the definitions. And I think coming to the value of the jobs... You know, I had an argument years ago when people said, oh, financial services, every job in a financial services investment is worth £50,000 a year. So I said, including the guy on reception and the cleaner, oh, you're being pedantic. Well, no, I'm not being pedantic. I mean, let's be realistic. Do we actually know? So when we're talking to companies now and we're trying to evaluate the value, we look at or we ask them to tell us what are the different duties and the different roles within the investment so that we can buy. Not everyone's going to tell you that, to be honest, but if we can get to that, you can be much, much more rigorous about the value. And then you can see how much of a headquarters it will actually be. So it's, it's getting enough trust from the client to be able to, to get them to tell you, but it's also being very clear about what you want this to be. And they've got to say publicly, this is a strategic decision making function for our company. Otherwise, you, you, you lose the brand and the reputation piece, which is really important. Right. Colm, would you agree that decision-making power is the, uh, the test, if you will, of a head office, of head office investment? Yeah, I, I think I, I would agree with that. I think it, it, it can start off and evolve over time, but it's about decision-making um, and it's about the accountability of those decisions. Mm. And that's where the value truly is. And those organisations uh, and I like uh, David's three categories because when you look at international headquarters or regional headquarters, it's primarily because they're going to be target driven. They're going to be target driven about extracting value from that market for the corporation. And that requires decisions and accountability. And truthfully, if you have decisions and accountability, even if you have disbursement of other operations, you have the value being brought back into that particular location. And that's the economic model that headquarters projects have. I, I, I don't think they're ever going to be super large. There will be the anomaly that is, but it's the value that centers in. 
because uh, if you're controlling a supply chain from Vancouver for the rest of North America, for example, you don't need a tremendous amount of people, but the value it's bringing back into Vancouver is exceptional. And the reputation. And the reputation. Factors, and the, yeah, the Eon yeah, example. Exactly. And actually, the other thing is, once you get the few, remember they cluster because they like to cluster. Why do they like to cluster? Because they want to be close to people who've already done this before. They want to be able to draw on the same talent pool. They want to be able to draw on the same expertise and the same business services. So I think it's around decision. If you have decision and accountability, then you will have value. Cool. David uh, highlighted three factors uh, for in terms of attracting head offices, uh, market, uh, cost and talent. I, I, I may, I'm paraphrasing, of course, and there may be other factors as well. C can I get your take on these three factors and how you would rank the relative importance of each of these three in terms of uh, attracting head office investment? Yeah, we've, we've, we've looked at this quite a lot in the last couple of years. And, and uh, if you look at the 10 top factors by sector, uh, what we have seen very clearly is that the top three are around access to markets, which are geographies, access to customers, which are critical because the faster they get access to those, the easier it is for those. And the third category is normally around talent and capability. Uh, I agree with David, actually. The cost issue, and if you come back to my piece around how costs are equalizing, it's important. Of course it's important. No business ever wants to think without thinking about cost and incentivization. But it's not as important in the ranking of that company's decision making as markets, talent, and customers. And it is a customer world. I mean, as, as costs come down, we're even starting to see manufacturing companies disperse manufacturing operations to be closer to customers because that's where the true value equation is. So I think that's the big change we've seen in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. This raises a, perhaps a challenge for Vancouver and British Columbia. If markets, in fact, are the most important factor and you've, you've subdivided markets into geographies and customers, uh, you know, it's not self-evident that we are in the heart of the massive customer market of North America. That would be the Midwest, uh, Northeastern United States, perhaps even the Southern states. How do we, uh, how do we make the value proposition that we can provide access to markets in the sense of geographies and customers that you just brought up? So I think this is, uh, this is uh, something that uh, we've been working with Vancouver with on the, in, in terms of what we call the value propositions and, and Kelly's here and, and she's leading this work and it's really important. Let's, let's come back to how David, uh, let's use David's definition for a second of international headquarters and regional headquarters. Why, why do you do that? Why, why does a company move from a global headquarters and try to create this? And David's quite right because when you're sitting in one geography or when you're sitting in one context of a headquarters, you don't always relate to customers uh, in the other geography that you need to expand to. And I would argue that um, although the world um, normally outside of Vancouver likes good espresso, um, the, the fact is that other factors around how they buy things and how they don't buy things is very different. And you need to be able to adapt that capability in an environment that is safe for the company to develop the product or to develop the service and to be able to refine it. And I often think that's when you look at the critical sectors of value, life sciences, ICT, I mean, we, we tend to think of technology as being homogeneous, and it is, but people are people. And people interact differently with these things. And I think what companies, therefore, are looking for with international reaches, is who is the person or who are the people who are going to help me adapt to this new market that I must be successful in? Um, I want to give you a personal, if I could just take two minutes, on a personal uh, uh, story on this. Many years ago, um, one of the one of the professional mistakes I made was trying to bring front loader washing machines into the United States market, um, where they use top loader washing machines. And, and we spent a lot of money on doing that from Europe in, because we had mastered the, the capability of manufacturing it. And, and, and the project completely tanked. And when we tried to unravel why this project tanked, it was because we didn't understand the customer mindset about how they were going to make these purchases. Now this is peculiar, isn't it? Because we knew the technology worked. We knew it had an economic argument. We knew it was lower cost. We knew it had lower emissions. We knew we had all of the things laid down in this. The problem was we sat in Europe looking in at a market. We didn't realize that the lifestyles of people were different. They still wash clothes, by the way, but how they did it and how it was part of their life was very different. This sounds like a really silly example, but it cost this company a lot of money. And so this comes back to my point of what you want is, and what we ended up doing was finding a landing base that could absorb that level of complexity for us and bring our product to market. 
And I think that's what international and regional headquarters do. Now, this is the opportunity for Vancouver. It doesn't sit across everything, and it won't sit across every sector. But if you target the sectors where it does sit, then you have a tremendous opportunity to be their portal into a market that, let's face it, looks very different to them from where they're sitting today. And that's the trick around this afternoon. Well, let's bring it to Vancouver then specifically. And I want to pick up on uh, an allusion that both of you made to the, uh, the changing world of international investment, particularly the rise of so-called emerging markets, not really emerging anymore, emerged already, particularly China and other Asian giants. Uh, many of these companies uh, are knocking on our doors. They're starting to knock on European doors as well. Uh, but they're generally not known to the investor attraction, investment attraction community. Uh, what's your sense of uh, how one goes about attracting companies from developing countries, from emerging markets, companies that may be very substantial in their home markets, have been very successful selling to their own consumers, now looking to go abroad, but generally not known in international investment uh, circles? Maybe I start with David. How do you do it uh, in London? I think what, what we... What we try and do with our, with our client base is say, if you can open up and tell us what it is you're trying to achieve, we'll come alongside you and help you to do that. So very much the sort of consultative sales sell. I was, when I was in Shanghai a couple of weeks ago, where I was taking British companies into China, and we did a week-long course at Fudan University School of Management. And what we were trying to do was explain to the British SME companies how Chinese customers think, how much they value culture against perhaps things that Westerners might see as the obvious way of making a decision. So I think there's a piece of education that we can do with Chinese business leaders about what they need to consider if they're going to look at or expand into whether it be the NAFTA area or the European free trade area. So I think that's that's point one. I think the second thing, and it touches a bit on what we were talking about before, there is no perfect solution. There isn't a city in the world that offers the perfect solution for every company. It's about finding the most or the best fit based on the, the various drivers. So the broader the conversation you can have with a company about what's really important to it and fit around that, the better. So I think, you know, the, the, the access to market for Chinese companies coming into North America, well, Say they went to Chicago, it's still a hell of a long way to LA and San Francisco from Chicago. Okay, it's not quite as far as Vancouver, New York, but if you've got the right people in the city that can do international trade, so we say we've got, you know, uh, 200 or so communities with more than 10,000, so we've got all the languages, all the cultures that you could possibly want in Europe. If you've got that sort of environment to bring companies into and you can teach them about how customers and clients are likely to behave, then I think you've got a chance. So there's an education piece and consultative sales. If it's just a straightforward sales piece, we are best because one, two, three, it's never going to work. You, they've got to trust you. Right. I'll come to Colm in a second, but you mentioned earlier the importance of the personal connections yeah. that uh, uh, families and uh, investor families have to a particular jurisdiction. You talked about schooling as a factor, tourism and so on. Of course, we have a very uh, special relationship with many Asian countries because of the huge immigration flows that we've seen over the last 20, 30 years. Just how important are those emotional ties? Let's say a little bit more about that. I mean, is this, are we kidding ourselves that these emotional ties will make a difference or should we really pay attention to them and try to uh, foster these uh, non-commercial attachments? No, I think, they're very I think they're very important. I think they're very important because if you're asked a question that you don't know the answer, what's the first thing you do? You ask somebody you know, somebody you trust. If you've studied in Vancouver or studied in London, if you've got a house in Vancouver or a house in London, if you're familiar with the people, that's where you would go to. So I think those, those emotional ties and those ties around trust are very important. And I think if you've done your formative education in a city or a country, then you'll always look mm. to that country and city as a place to, to find solutions. And I think there's an awful lot of Asian families who 
the next generation is being schooled outside of Asia. And one day they will be the decision makers within those companies. And I think, I think it's, it's a mistake and we've not done as good a job as perhaps we should have done, to be honest, over the years, not to factor that in because, you know, you need a long-term, this has got to be a long-term strategy. If you start a HQ strategy and try and measure the outcomes this time next year, you'll be sorely disappointed. Yeah. If you get a three, five, ten year horizon on it, when these influencers start to come through, then I think you can really see whether you've made a, made a difference. Gordon, your thoughts on the next generation of uh, investors from emerging markets? Yeah, I think... Uh, um, firstly, we know that the development of companies is always going to happen in emerging markets because, well, developed markets are kind of tanked out. Um, so that's, that's a key point. Um, I mean, depending on the study you read, um, you can argue that there's going to be another 7,000 or another 9,000 one billion dollar companies turnover uh, by 2025. And it really doesn't matter. It's enough. The point about when you ever hear these stats is you just need to know, is it enough? Um, let's talk about, I, I have a peculiar observation on this from the, more com the most companies I talk to, which is, isn't it interesting? We live in an age where electronic communications has never been stronger. We have email, we have uh, other forms. And yet, when you talk to company officials, they still want to meet you, and they still value even more the human contact that they get. The second thing is, um, there are companies in the developed world who, because of structures, legacy structures that they have, know how to do certain things because, well, they've always done them, and there's a pathway out to do that. Uh, emerging market companies, and I think emergent is a better expression, actually, yes. they're already there. They are highly sophisticated. They have as good technology as the companies that we think. We, we need to move our mindset about this. But it's a daunting world out there for them, just as it is for the other companies. And, and to me, isn't it interesting that although there's a lot more technology available, and although you could do this electronically, what people want is someone to come on the journey with them. And I'm often surprised when you sit in a room with a company and you say, yes, you're right, that's not done yet, but it'll be done in six years' time. And they think, that's okay. So I've got a commitment for six years. I can plan around that. I can build infrastructure. And what that tells me is that the importance of the dialogue with these players is much more significant than it was previously with other types of FDI investors. And the reason is, of course, we shouldn't be surprised about that. In their company evolution, this is typically their first step out. It has to be a safe, a safe step. No company takes a risky step. I mean, in years gone by, you literally went to your next door, then you went to your neighboring country, and then you try and build. So these, these people are catapulting out over longer distances. And what they want is a partner. And I don't want to use the expression partner and the glib expression of, of course, I'll partner with you. Let's sign a piece. Of no, somebody who will accompany them on the evolution of their journey and bring to bear the cocktail of things they need at a particular point in time. And that will evolve and that will change. So it won't be the same thing. So today they need access to research institutions to help them modify a product. Tomorrow it might be they need un to understand how logistical efforts can work and how they will evolve in a particular. It will change, but I think that is becoming the defining value characteristic. The trouble, I think, the, the challenge with that is what does it mean for the people who are trying to capture them? Because I think it breaks the model for how we've worked before. I think you can no longer say, we have academia who does this for you in our area. We've got government who does this. And we've got a whole private sector supply chain or support structure. I don't think they care. They're coming from an environment where those things didn't matter. Okay? What they want to know is, who's giving me the cocktail? And do I have to talk to 90 people to get it? Or do I have to talk to 15? And one of the things I've always uh, valued about working with London and partners uh, in London is that actually, I pretty much talk to one person all the time anytime I need support there. That is a fantastic, and, and they take away the complexity of, and we all, we all have complexity or infrastructure, we need that to develop our OS. So I, I think to me, um, all of these other factors are important, but who's going to accompany me on the journey, who's going to keep the dialogue open, and who's going to modify with me, and, give, and take the burden of internationalizing away from me. And if you do that, you've got a head start in this game. This is important implications for the work of HQ Vancouver. We're in the business of mixology, I guess, uh, mixing cocktails. But also it underscores the importance of this kind of event because we need to mobilize uh, resources that go beyond economic development and investment attraction agencies, uh, resources in the academic community, the NGOs, the industry associations, and so on and so forth. So really good advice for us there, Kom. Uh, you promised to tell us what you thought were the sectors or the areas that we should focus on. If you would do that, please, relatively quickly, yep. then I do want to open it up for some questions and discussion. Okay, so, so just looking at the global trends on 
where regional headquarters are coming from the markets of, of uh, from the Asian markets in particular. Um, the opportunities for, for, for Vancouver with the, what we call the highest propensity, that is where you're likely to get a decision that plays to your strength will be the electronics field, uh, software and ICT, particularly around digitalization. Uh, we think you have a strong play in life sciences. Um, you're not maximizing that play. Your ability to connect your powerful research engines with how products can be adapted and altered. And a very interesting healthcare answer, which has got the right ethnicity in its mix and its genome mix to be interesting places for these companies to invest. Um, we think they're the areas. However, where we think the richest patch is going to be is where you allow companies cross over the boundary conditions between sectors. So somebody asked me yesterday that I think that, uh, um, that, I think that uh, uh, you know, uh, BC had a play in the automotive sector. And I said, the answer was, no, you're not going to build cars. But you might very well develop and build the things that go into cars. So you have fuel cells. You, have, um, you see healthcare moving into the vehicles right now to manage chronic diseases. You see different entertainment systems, different guidance systems. In many cases, it's what's inside the cars where the value is. You get that crossover point between sectors. Um, you're not going to, uh, uh, you, there are certain functional areas of sectors you don't, won't work in, but you can build new solutions. This comes back to my ideas point. The value is in the boundary between sectors. It's no longer in the sector itself. Making pills for the pharmaceutical sector is not a rich business. Making pills that combine with medical devices to improve the efficacy or patient outcome, that's a very successful business. So it's, it's those areas where small interdisciplinary regions have tremendous opportunities to fix problems that, to be honest, larger scale issues can't be addressed. Super. All right, let's open it up to some discussion. We have a microphone here. If you'd quickly identify yourself, keep your comment or question short, if you would, please. I'll uh, do a sweep from left to right. I hope we have some questions. Anyone? Let's start over here then. Hi, good morning. Uh, very exciting uh, topic. Uh, my name is Hao Shi, uh, Agriculture Bank of China. Uh, we actually have a plan here open a uh, Canadian head office uh, in Vancouver. Uh, now I have a chance to speak and to ask questions for both gentlemen. Uh, that's the first one for uh, Ms. Riley. I guess you have been in so many different countries and uh, you also know Vancouver quite well. Uh, I guess back in 1990s, when uh, with, uh, North America signed the NAFTA, actually in Vancouver, we lost some head office to other neighbor countries. So this time around, we start this uh, initiative again. Now for, for your international experience, what's a key factor to make a success this time, if you can learn something from past? And uh, another question for uh, David. And uh, since you're from London, and uh, in a sense, you know, similar business as uh, HQ Vancouver. So I guess from your perspective, what's kind of uh, competitive advantage for Vancouver if you want to compete London to attract some uh, specially Asian Pacific head office? <laughs> There's no competition. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cohen, would you start? Uh, yeah, I, I'd actually like to, I'm going to, I'm going to answer this question by a slide I should have shown earlier on, if I could, um, if I could pull up my own. Uh, I think this is a really good, this is a really key question. Um, I made a comment earlier, which I probably should have expanded more about when I talked about inner, inner limits. Uh, I, want to, I want to tell you what I think is, based on different geographies, what I think you need to think about doing here. Um, I think it's a really important question. Um, I think the first thing you need to do is change what is the proposition from Vancouver to these, to these companies. And it's going to be simply beyond, we're good at academia, we're good at this, or we're good at that. It's got to be, actually, don't worry about that, we combine, the proposition crosses over, and you're going to allow, evolve with companies. The biggest, the biggest mistake you can make in headquarters projects is not to evolve with them. Think about a company that lands for the first time, put yourself in their shoes. Uh, you've been here how many years? Three years. Could you describe back to me how you think you have evolved as a business in those three, just three short years here? Oh yeah, basically it's uh, really attracting more local business communities such as the BC Business Council. Yeah, this business, business community is a key factor for me to to involve this way. You can learn what's a so that we can how to benefit each other in win situation we try to look for. Okay. Yeah. So if you just think about your own experience and multiply that to scale. 
because you've been learning and evolving from the environment you've been in. That's what I mean by the first point. But I think it needs a change in mindset here. This is where I get slightly, unfortunately, uh, slightly, uh, not controversial, but slightly, uh, uh, slightly confrontational. Because I think if you think about what it's like to come to a geography in terms of openness, infrastructure, and leadership, okay, I think you've got to be an advocate for openness. So it's not enough to say, yes, we're open. We're open. That's good. We're open. We're nice. Come and talk to us ever you want to. You've got to go out and say, no, what do you need? Let's advocate this type of openness for you. You're on the front foot. You're helping businesses survive. In terms of infrastructure, you can take a passive position of we host infrastructure, or you can say, no, we're an investor infrastructure. What do you need? What's the next thing you need? Okay, so 20 companies have told us they need this in the next decade. Let's get ready to prepare that in the next decade, and let's build that into our plans, as opposed to, yeah, we've built a lot of stuff, and it sits here, and if you want to use it, you can. And the last thing is about leadership. I think the leadership question is important. Companies want to be successful. Only companies create value in an economy. And therefore, to make them successful, you've got to show leadership about driving these companies together. So that would be my personal view on what I think this requires a step change in how Vancouver, and I, when I say HQ Vancouver, by the way, I'm really referring to BC, but I'm referring to a brand umbrella in BC which brings together all the great work done by the, the ministries and all the great works done by academia and industry and combines them together into powerful pro propositions. So I think that's really important. The second thing is you don't need to brand this and advertise it. I really like David's point. I think London have done this very well. They target. They go out and they talk. And when you target, it's not enough just to have a list. It's important you talk. The amount of things you learn from talking to companies on a daily basis is much greater than any amount of research you can ever do. David, David alluded to this as well. London do this very well. They're always talking to the company. What are your plans? If you tell us what makes you successful, we will try to match that to make you successful because that's what we want. It's a collective success scheme. So I think, I think there are the three things. The last thing I would say is whenever you're talking to companies now, don't talk about them coming to BC. Talk about them coming to North America and that by coming to BC, they will be successful in North America. I think what I would say is be, try and be clear what your proposition is because if, if you try to be all things to all companies and all things to all men, I think it, 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 you, you run out of things to say pretty fast. So I think it, you need to be very clear. Have you got a competitive advantage on talent in the electronic sector or research depth in the uh, life sciences, whether it be large molecules or, or small molecules or pros or whatever it is. Be very clear on that. I think if you don't and you're a, on a generic cell, you'll just become another city in another global competition and there'll be no differentiation, I, I would say that. Make sure you can back up anything you say. We've had a lot of issues when I was on the national government side where we had lots of really good sales folk but they're sales folk and you know <laughs> and if you target them on number of meetings and number of people into your pipeline then that's what they'll do whether anything drops out the bottom of the pipeline and creates jobs nobody cares so I think that's the that's the second thing and don't don't be afraid of the competition negative selling doesn't work it absolutely doesn't work and you know You've got to be aware that there's competition out there and just try and talk up what you can do, not what they're not going to do for you. I think we've learned that. And I think you need flexibility between the various levels of government. Our government is, is not easy to navigate. Um, you know, we've got boroughs. There are 33 boroughs in London. They've all got mayors or chief executives. They've all got planning powers. Then you've got the mayor and the Greater London Authority. Then you've got the Department of Local Government and then you've got Her Majesty's Government. There are layers upon layers and if you haven't got them all aligned and they're all talking slightly differently and they've all got sales teams and they've all got ministers travelling, oh my goodness me, that is a nightmare. And you turn people off fast, as Colin said, people just want one person to, to talk to and trust. And I guess the last thing was be clear what it is you're actually after. You know, what is the outcome you want? How are you going to measure success and base your proposition on that? Because, you know, if you're not clear why you're doing it, then you'll never kind of succeed. Every government claims success on every new initiative, right? Take for granted. We'll claim success in two years. My visit here was a great success. But is it? And if you're not sure at the beginning what you're after, then, yeah, 
I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure you'll ever convince the, the companies that you're the right place. Okay. Other questions, comments? Uh, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Marcus Shapiro. I'm a new immigrant to Canada, living in Vancouver, and came from London, England, so I've got some interesting perspectives. You moved your head office here, didn't you? Oh, I, moved, <laughs> I, moved, I moved my family head office, that's certainly yeah. the case. Uh, I've yes. got your name. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and as an aside, I think the question of um, uh, the ability of people to migrate and to get appropriate immigration visas or residency uh, is an issue. I think it is an issue for all countries, but certainly it isn't easy um, to get into this country, into Canada. Um, my question, though, more relates to the opportunities for Vancouver as a Canadian city to attract um, international HQs um, uh, in competition, if you like, with other American cities or other cities in North America that happen to be US cities. Um, I take the point about um, uh, avoiding knocking copy, but I'd like to suggest that Canada as a brand is a hugely positive uh, opportunity for, Van for Vancouver. Marketing Vancouver as a Canadian city, which by and after allows access to the whole of North America and the US marketplace, mm. but doesn't require those businesses to be headquartered, managed, and for the people to work out of the United States is a positive, and I'd be interested uh, in the panel's views on that proposition. Mm, super, thank you. Was there a question on this? Co yes, please. And then we'll, uh, if you wouldn't mind responding to both of them. Um, hi, uh, David Choi from uh, Industry Canada. So we're the uh, federal department that deals with microeconomics, uh, SNT innovation. Uh, we've been involved a little bit with this sort of HU attraction things here and there. Um, I wish you could sort of see how many thoughts I have in my head right now because it's such a rich topic of discussion. But uh, maybe, maybe sort of two, two related questions. The first to Colin related to, you talked about internal limits. I'm just wondering if you had any examples in your observations of uh, BC, Vancouver, Canada thus far, what those sort of internal limits are. And to David, um, you know, we struggle here in this city to, um, uh, so to say, have enough senior level management talent here. And we hear about this all the time in terms of our inability to sort of grow companies to a certain stage and they get picked up, they, they're sold to the Valley or to New York mm -hmm. or wherever. So my question there is, how, how important is it in your experience to have a, 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 a critical mass of senior level talent in order to beget more talent? Uh, I'm looting a little bit here that I'm wondering if, if you know, we talk about sometimes the, the, the schooling system, universities here do not do an adequate job in terms of this area. But anyways, I'm just wondering a little bit about that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Super. David, would you start? Okay. So, um, so if I'm asked, what, do, what does Canada mean to me? You know, do I have a vision of Mounties and maple syrup and all that stuff? Yes. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it's true. Do I have a vision of modern Canada? I'm not sure I do, actually. I'm not sure I could explain to you in any sort of coherent manner what modern Canada is. I get the openness. I get the... Um, you know, quality of life stuff by anecdote, but I, I think your point is right. What is modern Canada on the world stage? What does it mean? I'm not sure I could name any of your politicians. Does that matter? Don't know. It might do if you're the CEO of a company in Singapore. So, you know, it's, I think it's, there's, a, there's a need not to define too stringently because that can go horribly wrong. But, you know, we still play on Buckingham Palace and Beef Eaters and Tower of London and culture and history and art because that brings creativity. We play on that, but I think there's a modern Canada question, and I'm not sure I know the answer actually. Uh, and I'll need to be—I'd need to be fed that, um, and that would be, you know, brand brand Canada, because I don't think there's anything negative in it, but I don't know what the positive is. On on the point about executive management talent, I took it in the neck for years in San Francisco when I was based on the West Coast about the lack of experienced management talent to scale companies, and. The one thing that I couldn't answer at the time was nobody, name me a tech company that exits through the London Stock Exchange. And the reason they don't, because the, your executive management talent isn't good enough, they all have to come to, back to the Valley and our VCs pull them here. So we've looked at this pretty hard and I think it is important that it's, it's, it's important when you're, for your startup community, 
and to get your companies out of startup into any sort of sustained growth. You know, the other thing they say to us, where's your Google? You know, how many billion dollar companies? Actually, we've got quite a few billion dollar companies that have listed and we've got some exits now, but it's taken us 20 years to get there. So I think executive management talent, it isn't the skill of the idea, you've got creative people, it's the skill of the executive talent that know how to grow companies. And we, we have not cracked that nut. We're doing pretty well, certainly better than anywhere else in Europe, but it's, it's still a massive challenge. How many entrepreneurs leave the valley and come to London to grow their companies? There's more and more now, but we haven't cracked it yet. Cool. Um, I'd love to take the point in Canada. I think uh, you've got to dig hard here to find the real capability and then when you do, you're always pretty alarmed at how deep it is and how good it is. And uh, my big thing is always uh, how internationally comparable is capability because that really is what matters to companies. I mean, it's nice, being a nice place to live is really important, but you need to have the capability. I think there's work to be done there. And I think that work really needs to be fixed. Um, I, I think it's, it's in, in, in select areas, it is what I would call internationally comparable, but you have to look for it or it wouldn't fall at you. And I don't think that's good enough, particularly when in a time compressed world when executives don't really have the time to find out this type of stuff for themselves. So I take the point and there's a lot to be done okay, there. What are you saying, that the talent isn't there or that it is it, there, it, that it, we're not doing a good enough job of it, unearthing it? Correct, the capability right. is here, but it's not projected out well enough. And it might be because of a cultural reticence to do that. I mean, I, I'm often amazed that there are countries close by here where, to, um, in my view, capability could be even less, but they'd make more noise about it. So, and, and of course, there's a natural cultural... I didn't say where the country was, I said it's nearby. <laughs> uh, nearby is anything, right? So, and, and isn't, this an interesting, isn't this an interesting thing, right? Um, so when you look at science here, when you look at innovation here, it's deep. But let me tell you what is sad about that. My view is that you could actually state or assert that BC has missed a number of waves of massive development because of this reticence. And that pretty much is unacceptable, in my view, economically. You can't just allow that to continue. Um, can I come back to the point on inner limits? Uh, yeah, sorry if, if that was slightly convoluted. Um, uh, it, it's... It's, uh, it's, I, I make the expression glibly, and, and I shouldn't make it, but I'm going to make it again because I don't have a better one. Um, this is the perfect uh, recipe where BC is at the moment of, of, of uh, freedom and economics, where things are created and properly resourced and, and done correctly, but they're not connected well enough. And I think that's the big challenge. So when I talk about inner limits, the inner limit is where you say, Thus is my scope, and I go no further. And actually, what you need to get it in the global race right now is who's prepared to walk across the boundary point. It's messy. I understand it's messy. It's not nice because you're saying, why has that person walked across the boundary to me? Why are they talking to... But you've... And I know it's uncomfortable for people, okay? But get comfortable with the discomfort because that's the global race right now. So if you connect those two points together. Super. Uh, were there two questions in this corner of the room? One or two? Please, uh, last question then, if, uh, unless there's anyone with a burning desire to get it off his or her chest. No? All right, please. Hi there, Noel D'Souza. I'm from the media and entertainment industry. And um, the question I had, you touched on emotional ties that can sometimes lead to a decision of setting up regional or international headquarters. Um, I'm wondering, based on, you know, a pretty young country, city, what about the cultural and historical ties that can also, can you touch on that as a question to the panel? Can I just ask, when you say cultural historical ties, you mean with immigrant nations, or do you mean the old country? Well, um, it's a combination of new and old, because what, I, what I'm getting at is, if you do look at the UK and you look at its, you know, the Commonwealth, it's kind of right. attracted the interest from countries like India or the Caribbean or in terms right. of attracting some of that investment. So Tata and uh, Jaguar and Tetley and so on. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Whereas we're still a relatively young nation, center, uh, without a historical tie of any, any firm industry that planted itself in here. Mm -hmm. How does that play in? And what, what are the challenges for Vancouver to be able to address that? Yeah, we didn't colonize half the world. So <laughs> does that help us, do you think? Well, if you listen to Colum, I was there for most of the colonization. <laughs> 
I think, I think what, what happened in the UK experience was our economy tanked in the 70s. And that was a huge wake-up call to do you now need a professional inward investment organisation. And that was created, I think it was the Invest in Britain Bureau or something like that, um, back in the late 70s. And it was quite clever at the time because they realised that, yes, you can go to North America, to the US, and, and that's obviously where, where a lot of... Um, investment would flow but actually look at what's happening around the world look at the commonwealth and see what's happening in india because india was just starting to show signs and nobody knew that the tartars and everyone else would be quite so big but there was a there was you know necessity mother of invention there was a realization that we need to this is a global game our economy's tank you need to do something global so there was a list then made that said let's talk to everyone and anyone and we've had a history of open borders, a history of being the protagonist of the free market, welcoming people in and out. And that was when it started, I think, to realise that you had to find commonality wherever it was and go after it. So we, you know, I'd served in New Delhi for three years and everywhere I went, everyone called me sir because I was a diplomat. And when I was in Ghana, another Commonwealth course, it was all sir, it was all sir. And it didn't matter how many times, it was just a mark of respect to the, to the UK, but it didn't mean that they weren't very, very savvy, quick-minded, innovative business people, and what they really wanted, once you got through the bubble of pseudo-respect, to say, right, what are you going to do for me now? How can you make the numbers work? Where is it going to come from? So I would say you don't, you, you, once you've got your proposition right, you know what you're after, then you can start to figure out where to take it, and nobody should be off the table, and if you can find any way through the door, any commonality, so like prime ministers talking together at Chogham, why doesn't the PM of Canada say to his opposite number in India or whatever it is, let's talk about how we can do more on whatever it happens to be. I, I think, you know, it's a global market. Use where you've already got a leg up, where there's a familiarity, where there's a relationship and build on it, in my view. Chogham is the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, which, by the way, our prime minister is a little bit cool on these days. It's another story. Did he change his mind based on that? Then? Last word to call. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, legacies are useful. They can also cut both ways. I mean, I know, for example, that um, from running trade operations in the UK, there are some countries that the UK will never win a project in. It doesn't matter how good their technology or capability is, so it cuts both ways. Uh, but, but I think the interesting thing about new countries uh, that um, with new people coming in is they show a higher propensity of innovation, creativity, and ideas. And that's the future commodity. That's the future currency of success in capitalist worlds anyway. So um, it's a positive thing. It's not a negative thing. Being new and having lots of new ideas enriches the colours in the garden. And that's the most powerful thing you can have. Well, I don't think we could have asked for a better kickoff to this head office conversation series. Uh, thank you so much, David and Colm, for uh, setting the stage beautifully, um, articulating some of the ground conditions, if you will, for investment attraction, uh, the brave new world that we're facing, uh, rather a different environment for investment attraction than perhaps was the case in the last one, two, three decades, and giving us some very concrete ideas about how we might go about doing our job. I'm very much taken by the idea that there are some inner limits that we need to overcome, uh, perhaps a reticence or a shyness on our part. Come, I would say that the reason why you haven't found a good espresso is precisely because our good espresso companies haven't made the pitch to you. <laughs> and that uh, there are some in this room, I think, who can approach Cobb and tell him where the best espresso uh, coffees can be had. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you above all for coming out this morning. Please do uh, keep in touch. We will let you know about upcoming sessions. But the work of HQ Vancouver is ongoing. It's not simply a series of seminars. We need your help in this endeavor. It's an ecosystem we're trying to build. It's about uh, the boundary conditions, about connecting the dots. And uh, we see you very much as uh, part of that ecosystem. So please join me now in um, thanking our guests and uh, doing so as I give them a small token of our appreciation, first of all, to David Slater. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And then to Thank you. There you are. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.